Good, uh, good evening, everyone, uh, and welcome to this evening's panel discussion of uh, the war on Ukraine. Uh, my name is Daniel Beer. I'm the head of the history department uh, at North Korea. I'm a specialist in national history. Uh, I'm joined by a panel of distinguished experts uh, in history, politics, and the culture of Ukraine and Russia. So joining us this evening from Ukraine uh, are Volodymyr Dubovic, uh, Professor of International Relations at the I.I. Mechnikov uh, National University in Odessa, and Natalia Musienko, who's a leading research fellow at the Modern Art Research Institute of the National Academy of Arts of Ukraine uh, in Kiev. Uh, regrettably, uh, Olga Ornich from Manchester has had to withdraw from the panel this evening, but from the UK, we're also joined by William Blacker, uh, Associate Professor in the Comparative Culture of Russia and Eastern Europe at the School of Slavonic Studies uh, and East European Studies, uh, sorry, the School of Slavonic and East European Studies at uh, UCL. And from the United States, we are joined by Professor Samuel Green. Uh, Sam Samuel Green is Professor of Russian Politics and Director of the Russia Institute at King's College uh, London. So uh, this meeting is being recorded. Uh, so any questions, as I understand it, that you do ask uh, or any comments you put in the chat will also be recorded. Um, we're discussing, obviously, terrible events in Ukraine, and this panel, uh, like um, many others that have been hosted at academic institutions across the globe, uh, is, of course, open to the challenge of sort of intellectualizing what is first and foremost an urgent military and political crisis and a humanitarian catastrophe. Um, but we are trying to stand back uh, a little however difficult that might be, um, and uh, sort of stand back from the immediacy of the invasion to discuss uh, not only its current progress, but its origins uh, and what it tells us about both Ukraine and Russia today, and to contemplate uh, what its likely consequences uh, will be. So I'd like to begin uh, by uh, asking uh, Volodymyr to uh, speak about uh, the current political and military uh, situation uh, in Ukraine. So, um, uh, Volodymyr Volodymyr, then the floor is yours. Thank you. All right, thank you. I hope that you can, you can hear me. Is that, is that true? You can hear yeah. me? Good. The volume turned up a little, uh, but yes. Good, good. All right, so uh, thank you for doing this. Uh, I mean, uh, each and every event of this type uh, is really helpful to us. It's extremely important for us to see that we are not, not abandoned, that we are not uh, forgotten. And therefore, all of the roundtables that me and my other colleagues are taking part in in this day uh, are extremely important. So the war is raging, of course. It's uh, 12th day or something. Uh, they say it's 12th day. Uh, it seems like it's been a year. Uh, and uh, it's raging uh, high. And it's really a very hot situation here in Ukraine. Hot and hard situation in Ukraine. I don't think I would uh, go and repeat uh, the, the news, because most of you in the audience uh, are probably following the basic uh, developments here on the ground, where the battling, the fighting is where the major battles are, uh, where Russians are trying to advance, where they are not, where they are stuck, and so on. Uh, right now, we see, of course, that this is an all out invasion. Uh, we've been guessing for several months uh, prior to February 24th uh, what, what is going on. Uh, is it some kind of intimidation game or is it preparation for invasion? And now we know it's a letter. Uh, it's been always a preparation for invasion uh, because now we also have the documents captured uh, from, from, from the personnel, Russian military personnel in Ukraine uh, telling us clearly that it's been uh, prepared for months and months. Now, uh, Russian uh, performance in Ukraine, militarily speaking, is of course is, uh, underwhelming if you look at it uh, from a Kremlin point of, sight, uh, point of view. Uh, it, they are definitely behind the schedule. Uh, whatever Putin is saying, his public appearances or semi-public appearances or some CGI appearances of the recent days, uh, that uh, everything is going, going according to the plan, it's not true. Uh, of course, it's not going according to the plan. But having said that, uh, they have advanced in uh, several directions. Uh, and they're not controlling much of the territory, uh, but they are a major threat. 
they've used already almost all of the uh, forces and troops that they've accumulated around our borders uh, prior to the invasion. Uh, I think it just today was announced by major military, Western military intelligence that it's been 100% of troops being used now. Uh, whether they can uh, somehow mobilize and uh, re-engage and uh, bring more so-called uh, second echelon to put even more military pressure on Ukraine is, is doubtful and questionable. It's not out of question. I mean, it's, it's feasible, I suppose, but not in a short-term uh, uh, perspective. So uh, the, why are they struggling so much? Uh, well, uh, first of all, of course, because of Ukraine's resistance. Uh, Ukraine is resisting as it promised it will and it, and it does uh, and we're not only talking about military performance which is which is amazing which really the Ukrainian military is outdoing out themselves uh, they're really uh, doing much better than many others uh, in the west even friends of Ukraine even people who invested in in uh, retraining our troops uh, have been uh, hoping that they will uh, they deliver se severe blows against Ukrainian against Russian troops so resistance on the military side, but I would go further and I would say that it's a civil society, it's entire people, it's entire population. It's everyone top down and or, or bottom up, whichever way you like it. It's from President Zelensky, who is resilient, who is uh, who is staying there in Kiev and everyone is railing around him, around the flag. His ratings are up in the sky and no one cares anymore about what he did, what kind of mistakes and what he thought about him before, but now he's a president of a wartime country and his messages are short and pointed and they're mobilizing people and they're showing the leadership is there and it's, it's extremely important and i and that comes from someone like myself who didn't really much like the guy much and he didn't want i don't want didn't vote for him i thought he made a major mistake maybe even in the months prior to the to the invasion when he actually don't play in the threat and he actually said uh, you know that uh, for some reason in the west the us in particular is uh, you know it's uh, inflaming this or somehow it's, it's just exaggerating the threat but now he is definitely playing a major positive role but everyone else is playing this role uh, ukraine is something opposite from a failed state right now there have been some discussion in the previous months like comparing ukraine to afghanistan and there you have it here is the difference everyone is doing their job under the fire, under tremendous, strenuous effort, uh, you know, very difficult circumstances. People going to work, you know, people baking bread, you know, people putting fires down, and there are so many fires. Military is fighting the war, you know, government people appearing on TV and telling them what they're doing in terms of evacuation trains, for instance. So uh, there is so much going on that you wouldn't expect, and I didn't expect being Ukrainian living here, that uh, our, uh, you know, civil servants even, you know, whom we criticize for a good reason so many times before, they would be actually performing so well. And there is a consolidation, and there is a consolidation. But yet, that being said, of course, the war is raging, and no one knows for how long it will be raging. There's been around three of negotiations today. Uh, unsurprisingly, I don't think it brought any positive results. There is a new, a renewed talk about a green uh, communitarian corridors out of some cities that have been besieged. Uh, but we've heard that out of, after rounds one and two. And uh, those uh, agreements were violated by Russians. And not only those uh, corridors were not uh, uh, respected or kept, or they even fired at them. In case of Mariupol, uh, Russian troops fired specifically at the location points where the people were collecting, gathering uh, to, to evacuate from the city. So there's no trust whatsoever uh, to what Russia does or says or promises or their guarantees on any front. Uh, in Ukraine, it's very important to understand there is no uh, desire, there is no appetite whatsoever for surrender, for capitulation. If anything, if anything, this country which is in ruins, in fire, you know, and los losing terrible amounts of life, including civilians, is even less prone now for some concessions to the Russian demands. Uh, it's unforgiving. You know, prior to the invasion, uh, people were saying, okay, well, let's see, maybe we should uh, have some deal, maybe do some concessions, and we, we can actually negotiate here and there. And Zelensky was sending those signals, actually, uh, prior to the, to the start of invasion. Right now, the anger is so overwhelming, you know, that this would prevent, be it the government or be it the population of, 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 of really, you know, saying okay to the Russian demands. And the demands that have been uh, put forward today by Peskov, Russian's, uh, Putin's uh, press secretary, they are basically back to the pre-war times. 
you know, he is talking about Ukraine recognizing uh, so-called Donetsk and Luhansk People's Republics, uh, recognizing Crimea part of, of Russia, and then, uh, of course, changing constitution and, uh, so Ukraine wouldn't be able to join any blocs. And then, of course, people are debating what they mean, only NATO or EU also. And most people say maybe EU also. Uh, but that is basically their agenda before in the weeks and months coming to the invasion. So what does it tell you? That after 12 weeks of using so much money, firepower, uh, lives of the military personnel here in Ukraine, and incurring so much harm on Ukrainian civilian population, they're basically back to the status quo in their demands. They're failing dramatically. You know, there is no talk about denazification anymore, whatever that meant. You know, we can go into that, and uh, we have a full panel of uh, historians. I actually am a historian by my first training as well. And we can talk about that. What, what did they mean by denazification? Uh, we are not ready for any ceasefire, uh, neither Russia nor Ukraine. There'll be some more fighting, I'm afraid, and there'll be more intensified shelling and bombing of uh, civilian quarters in major Ukrainian cities, I'm afraid, and there'll be more people uh, dead. Uh, they've bombed hospitals already. It's full style Aleppo campaign right now, by now, be it Grozny, whoever remembers Grozny from 1990s, or Aleppo, more recent memories. Uh, there have been 34 hospitals bombed, some of them beyond uh, being used, uh, others have been just damaged heavily and they're still in use. Uh, and of course, kindergartens, and of course, uh, schools, and of course, you know, factories and, and, and shops and so on. So uh, Ukraine uh, is in possession of a moral outrage and political mobilization. And by political mobilization, I'm saying everyone, everyone, basically. Uh, Russia hammered heavily the most pro-Russian areas of the country, you know, this is in other words, it's a, it's, it's a finally, it's total death of, of any future for the Russian world here in Ukraine. Because what they're doing, and they, you know, and they're attacking Kharkiv, they're basically trying to ruin Kharkiv, which is, uh, uh, you know, together with Russia, with Odessa, maybe my hometown, uh, having the, the biggest, the most sizable pro-Russian segment of population here in Ukraine. And of course, that's where you have ethnic Russians in big numbers and Russian speakers, of course, as well, everywhere else. In, you know, in Sumy as well, and in some other parts of the country, in Mariupol and, and uh, you know, north of Azov Sea. Uh, so the people who actually kind of liked Russia before, uh, or who Putin before, they are now sitting under the bombs. They're now sitting in the basements. So that's another thing. They are really losing Ukraine. I mean, if one of the reasons for Putin to start the war was to prevent Ukraine slipping away from Russian sphere of influence, he contributed to, to that being happening now maybe perhaps on finitive, you know, kind of permanent basis. You know, whatever happens now, when the war stops, uh, I couldn't imagine the Ukrainian population forgiving Moscow for what it done to us. And I'll stop here. Obviously, the situation is still hard. Oh, that hasn't been attacked yet, my hometown. For whatever reasons, we can discuss that. And there have been several, you know, versions here and there, uh, you know, kind of people are trying to venture and ideas about why Odessa was intact, because many people actually thought that it will be attacked in the first, among the first targets in the first wave of assault, and it wasn't. You know, you know as they're afraid of uh, landing, uh, sea landing, amphibious operation, which is risky, uh, do they want to bring more troops by land uh, by capturing Nikolai first? Uh, what is going on? Or are they losing airplanes now uh, around Odessa, uh, you know, quite a few in several days, and they even lost a ship, a major Corvette-type petrol boat, ship, boat, uh, boat. Uh, battleship uh, the other day. Uh, so Odessa is a risky, tricky uh, direction for them. But of course, if they're planning to increase their attacks, they'll go. They'll go there because also Transnistria is there as well. That's another factor. Let's not go there because I'm already abusing my time limits. So the war is raging. It's not stopping. Ukraine is not losing. Russia is not winning. Who's going to prevail will very much depend on on the fighting spirit and there is plenty of it in Ukrainian people right now. And another question which we can address in the discussion is the Western support, which is manifold, manifold, and it's playing its role as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor uh, Dubovic. Um, and um, I'd like to turn now to uh, Natalia Mosenko, who's going to talk to us um, a bit more about some of the, the issues that um, Professor Dubovic was, was, was discussing in relation to uh, Ukrainians uh, sort of uh, Ukrainian identity and Ukrainian culture um, in, in, in recent years um, and, and um, what the sort of the background has been to um, this 
um, response of the Ukrainian people to um, Russian aggression. Um, so over to you, uh, Dr. Masenko. Thank you. Uh, do you hear me? Yes. Hi, I can't have more lights now because um, I speak you from Kiev downtown and uh, fully prepared, uh, the city is fully prepared to fight uh, enemy. As uh, Professor Dubovic already underlined, uh, as Odessa as well. Uh, I shall start, because this is a Russian-Ukrainian war, I shall start with Russian, speaking about Russian, that we are witnessing now a collapse of so-called Russian world. Sergei Jadan, our charismatic poet, writer and singer, pointed out yesterday at the heavily bombarded Kharkiv, Russian-speaking city, that Russian great humanistic culture is sinking like a Titanic now, more precisely, like a Russian warship. Those who are following this war know that the Russian warship has become a man in this war. So this is going with the Russian world. In this war, culture again suffered a crushing defeat. This time, the culture of Dostoevsky and Tolstoy, Russian ballet, Russian cinema, and of course, Russian studies at the Western universities. Because the defeat of culture in reality is civilian war by hail, and the military too, by the way, Ukrainian innocent children killed by the barbarians Teardrop by Dostoevsky, famous teardrop by Dostoevsky. They started by the bombardment of the Kiev Central uh, Hospital for Children. The defeat of Russian culture is 71% of Putin's support and 65 support of war. And among them, top of Russia's higher educational establishment the Union of Russian Rectors, the 185 who signed this letter will not be forgotten, as well as Union of Writers that supports the Putin wars, as well as cinema, arts, etc. They don't know, oh, give me a break. They do not know. I have a, just a simple example. I uh, uh, have, uh, I know one journalist, Russian journalist, uh, she lives uh, for years in the United States and I follow her Facebook page and uh, she has a lot of followers and also she has a dog. And while she's very anti-war person and while she's posting her dog, she has a lot of, lot of likes. But when she is posting the news about war, which I'm also sending to her, she has some one, two, or maybe three reactions. They see it, but they don't want the two modes to be implicated. The entire Russian Institute of Cinematography uh, hence, the, to recognize the independence of the so-called uh, Elandair Republic, artificially created by Russia. Those artists who are critical of uh, Putin have shown extremely passivity. They did nothing to stop this terrible war or to speak against it war began. They are afraid, but what about the Russian world? world? What about this? famous teardrop by Dostoevsky. Now, Ukraine is full of these teardrops and killed, killed children. Those, uh, 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 now the attempts of those who want to sign collective letters and uh, uh, <clears throat> do some signs of uh, peace look very hypocritical. These days, Ukrainians are defending their freedom and try to exist. And of course, we definitely need help. And uh, it is absolutely for us understandable that uh, as uh, 
the uh, Russian petrol should be limited in the world. L Russian culture should be limited too, because it is prepared ideologically basis for this war. This culture justified Russian aggression. The culture that Russia knows how to use for its purpose, like its weapons. Cultural, uh, Russian culture actually created all these uh, slaves. Ukrainian culture is a culture of freedom. That's why the, we are antagonistic. In uh, 2014, uh, we have a Maidan in Ukraine. And after Maidan, the war started. The war started eight years ago. Now it's a total invasion of our country. And why I am pointed uh, Maidan now? Not because it was crucial uh, moment uh, for Putin uh, to start invention of uh, invention of Ukraine eight years ago, but also because Maidan show our culture and how independent we are. Uh, in uh, twenty fifteen, I uh, wrote a book Art of Maidan, and here. You can see the slogan on the cover page, a poster, and its translation is very simple. I feel freely. And artists always played an important role in Ukraine. And well, I would not go for centuries, but I shall start, I shall say some words about Maidan that collected, uh, Maidan that collected all genres of art, all artists, from right to left, from all generations, from uh, uh, um, poems, sculptures, uh, uh, graphics, uh, everything, everything. And everybody were united uh, on my, in Maidan to create a new Ukraine. Uh, speaking about artists, uh, Let's uh, don't forget that now our president, so popular in the world, is a, and is an actor. And uh, actually, uh, I know only two president actors who tried, and uh, one of them successfully did it, and now another is trying to do. And I am. Uh, uh, absolutely believe in his success, only two president artists. First was Ronald Reagan, and now Volodymyr Zelensky uh, appeared. Uh, I uh, really impressed, Ukraine is really impressed by uh, our president, and now he has supported 91%. Because uh, uh, he is working really great and succeeded of total unification of uh, uh, our country. And this is also the case of the art. Uh, in the last uh, um, Last uh, fall, I had a conversation with one uh, important uh, foundation in Europe, uh, European Cultural Foundation, and they have like their base slogan, uh, 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 as their, their, their base, uh, such a notion as the European sentiment. So from my point of view, we discussed uh, this notion that appeared uh, in 1949 after war, and from my point of view, all the European sentiment is concentrated now in Ukraine. And of course, Ukraine drastically need help of uh, our partners, uh, of our allies, uh, to realize its European sentiment. Moreover, to realize the European sentiment of the Europe. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Masinko. And I'll, I'll hand over now to um, William Blacker, um, who's going to talk about uh, the, the politics of of memory and the forces that have shaped this uh, this contemporary Ukrainian identity. Um, thank you. Um, thank you very much, Daniel. Um, 
Um, yeah, that's better. Um, so, uh, in terms of, I'll say a few words about uh, memory politics and history in relation to um, to uh, what's happening in Ukraine at the moment. Um, Ukraine, of course, like like any country, has a complicated history. Maybe more, maybe Ukrainian history is a little bit more complicated than than many. Um, it is viewed uh, in different ways by by different people in Ukraine and Ukrainian society. Um, and one can speak on sort of endl endlessly on various topics such as memory of the Holodomor, memory of the you know, World War II nationalist movement, the Holocaust, decommunization processes, all of these things. Um, Topics which have taken up a lot of, um, uh, which have inspired a lot of discussion, a lot of analysis of Ukraine over the last um, few years. Um, all of them important topics, all of them interesting topics, often contentious topics. Um, I don't want to talk specifically about any of them, but maybe talk about how um, how we approach this problem and how we relate it to um, to Ukrainian society and Ukra Ukrainian politics, and especially to the uh to the to the war um i got a message in i, I can barely hear you Is, um, can can you hear me yeah okay um so memory politics has been a prominent feature of uh, the kind of internal political landscape in ukraine for uh, quite a few years now particularly after the maidan revolution uh, particularly around the, the so-called uh, decommunization laws. Um, some commentators have sort of interpreted the situation, um, have looked at, looked at, analyzed the situation in such a way that they see attitudes towards the Soviet past, towards World War II as kind of key dividing factors in Ukrainian society. Um, and they attribute a certain importance to them around the events of the Maidan and, and even in terms of the war. And sometimes this is mapped onto this kind of idea that there's an east-west uh, divide uh, within Ukraine. A um, couple of things to say about that. So first of all, you know, the extent to which these memory political problems are really uh, decisive, divisive problems in Ukrainian politics in society is debatable. Um, you know, if you look at recent elections, it's very difficult to see that, um, to identify mem memory politics as being something particularly influential for a candidate's success. You know, and if you look at Zelensky's success, he very much, you know, you know had a very, very successful uh, presidential campaign, a huge majority, and really didn't um, bother too much with memory politics at all. Um, after the Maidan, after 2013-2014, we saw memory politics was kind of driven by the revitalized uh, Institute of National Memory. This institute was not created after Maidan, it existed before, but it came much more prominent. Um, and that was headed by um, people who I would sort of describe as maybe sort of patriotically or nationalistically inclined memory activists who had quite a, a, a clear and, and quite narrow agenda. Um, since then, since Zelensky came to power, the institute itself has been handed over to a new team. Uh, and now it's much more a kind of tool for uh, public engagement and education and doesn't have a particularly strong political profile. Um, and memory politics have really died down a lot in the last few years. Um, so I think much, much in the same way that language um, functions in Ukrainian political discourse, memory politics, you tend to see them dragged up um, by certain interest groups around, often around election times, in order to um, speak to certain identity narratives, appeal to um, sort of imagined sectors of the electorate, which, which uh, I think sometimes don't necessarily exist in the way that those politicians imagine. Um, like language, these questions, of course, do have a certain traction amongst Ukrainians, um, but these are not questions which really are huge vote winners. They're not things that I think ordinary people in Ukraine um, really care too much about. And they're certainly not, not the sort of things that will sway them one way or the other in terms of their political choice. Uh, they're much more interested in uh, economic policies, corruption and questions like that. Um, it's also very difficult to map 
any kind of memory divide ge geographically onto Ukraine. So Ukraine has a, a, a complex history as being part of different empires and different states. Um, of various times, and that means that local history, local memory is is very very diverse, and it varies across around, around the country. And it's one of the things that make I think makes makes Ukraine really interesting. Um, the and what you find, rather than some kind of sharp you know border where on the one side people remember the past in this way, and the other side people remember the past in that way, whether it's about the Soviet Union or the war. Um, you see that across Ukraine, you have very um, a memory culture that is quite eclectic. It's quite hybrid. It picks and chooses from different kinds of narratives and uh, um, uh, different uh, historical periods and kind of combines them into this kind of interesting uh, mix, which, which varies certainly across across the country. Um, I would say that maybe even more than internally, memory politics have been important internationally. Um, sort of symbolically, internationally. Uh, so, for example, the perceived promotion of you know, World War II nationalist figures by these, I would you know, still say relatively niche political interest groups has very much riled Poland. Um, uh, one of, of course, one of Ukraine's key neighbours and its key allies, as, as we've seen recently in its reaction to, to what's happening. Um, and that has caused a bit of tension and it's caused, it's caused uh, some diplomatic rows, especially given the, the kind of nationalistic memory politics of the, the Polish governments of recent years. Um, and of course, Russia pays close attention to all this, as we know. Um, so again, you know, the, this, this sort of discourse around uh, uh, nationalism during World War II, Ukrainian nationalism in World War II, um, but also the way that Ukraine has really rejected the kind of uh, great patriotic war myth in recent years and, and reformulated the way it commemorates the Second World War, um, which I think you know, is, is one of the healthier developments in, in Ukrainian memory politics in recent years. That's really been um, blown out of proportion you know, vastly by, by Russia and its kind of um, absurd uh, ideas about uh, uh, Nazi Ukraine. Um, and that, you know, there's 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 an argument that some in some some ways that these policies, you know, the decommunization policies, the attitude towards um, certain figures from the national past, towards uh, World War II collaboration, um, these things have also caused a certain amount of sort of PR damage to to Ukraine in the West, um, where you know they, they are sometimes picked up uh, and in uh, slightly simplistic ways. Uh, um, but nevertheless, you know, these things that, are, that can be problematic and need to be spoken about. Um, just to finish, one final point. However, you know, having said all of this, I think it's really, really important for us to remember that none of this um, bears any kind of direct relation to uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Um, you know, the attempt by Putin to link, uh, you know, Ukraine's memory culture, Ukraine's memory politics to his aggression um, should be resisted by us uh, as analysts. I don't think any of this is about memory. Uh, I don't think any of it's about history, really, although, you know, Putin has been lecturing us about history a lot recently uh, in preparing the ground for this. Um, none of these historical things, these memory things, um, have any kind of causal link or justification or explanation for the aggression that we're seeing. Um, and, and like the language question, actually, um, it's uh, a thing which is used by the Russian state to distract from their aggressive policies, which, you know, in my view, have much more to do with, um, as Natalia said, the kind of culture of freedom, the development of democracy in Ukraine, which the Russian elites very much fear will spread into Russia and threaten um, their power and, and their wealth. So I think, you know, we can discuss the memory politics and the history, but we have to keep it uh, in, in perspective. Thank you. Um, so thanks very much, Dr. Blacker. So I, I'm going to hand over now to, um, to my colleague, uh, Dan Stone, uh, who's going to say more about um, the the memory specifically of uh, World War World War Two uh, in this context. Thank you. 
Thanks, Daniel, and uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, I'll be brief because I'm the outlier on the panel, not being a Russia or Ukraine specialist. Uh, I'm a historian of the Holocaust, and I want to pick up on uh, what uh, both um, Dr. Blacker and uh, Professor Dubovic uh, have said, uh, particularly the question uh, that um, Professor Dubovic asked, which was about uh, why Putin is talking about denazifying Ukraine. Um, this, I think, is goes to the, the nub of, of things, uh, particularly with respect to what um, William was saying about the, the Russian abuse of the, the memory of the Great Patriotic War. Um, and I think for, for those of us who work in the history of the Holocaust, the, uh, the history of Ukrainian collaboration, uh, the role played by the OUN, the Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists, and the UPA, its armed wing, the Ukrainian insurgent army, uh, loom large. Uh, and we're used to uh, reading about the role played by uh, Ukrainian auxiliaries, um, auxiliary police, um, SS battalions, and so on, involved uh, in the murder of, uh, of Jews and of Poles and others uh, during uh, the period of the Nazi occupation of, uh, of Ukraine. Um, the role played by the so-called uh, Banderovtsi, the, the Banderites, the followers of, of, of Stepan Bandera of the, the OUN, um, is uh, something that Holocaust historians are very familiar with. And I, I, but I want, I think, to say that uh, what William said is, is right, that uh, we have to divorce that history from what is happening in Ukraine today and in order to understand what Putin is talking about when uh, he's, he says he needs to denazify Ukraine and insists on the need for a new Yalta. I think you know, when Putin said we need a new Yalta, uh, this in a sense was to, to give the game away. It's uh, in 1945 uh, when uh, Stalin argued and when the Red Army uh, insisted that uh, Russia had uh, played a major role in defeating Nazism, uh, the anti-fascist narrative, the claim for uh, security in Eastern Europe for the Soviet regime at least had some basis in fact. Uh, the, uh, this is not to justify the, the Stalinization of Eastern Europe, um, but it was of course uh, true that the Red Army had defeated uh, fascism in Europe. Um, what's happening today is the, uh, the continued use of the language uh, of anti-fascism uh, in order to justify a regime which has, in a sense, become fascist. Uh, we see a complete inversion of uh, the anti-fascist narrative that drove uh, the Soviet period, the myth of the Great Patriotic War. I don't really think that Putin is trying to recreate the Soviet Union, but he is continuing to use and to weaponize uh, the, the myth of, uh, the, the sustaining myth of the Soviet Union, which was uh, the great patriotic war victory in order to justify the land grab uh, and supposedly supposed security policy, politics uh, of contemporary Russia. Um, so why should we divorce uh, that history from what Putin is saying? I mean, there, there are clear examples in uh, modern Ukraine uh, of celebration of, uh, of Bandera. So for example, uh, I'm, I'm using a book here uh, by Yelena Subotic called Yellow Star, Red Star, which is on uh, History of Holocaust Memory in Post-Communist Europe, uh, which is, uh, I think, a, a very useful book. And she talks, for example, about the fact that uh, Bandera and uh, Roman Shukevich, who was the, the leader, of, the military leader of the UPA, uh, have both been made uh, heroes of Ukraine in 2010 and 2007, respectively, or the fact that uh, a, a monument to Bandera has been erected on the former uh, ghetto in Drohobych, uh, as examples of the ways in which uh, the, uh, the Banderites have been celebrated in, in Ukrainian politics and in, uh, in Ukrainian culture. And this is exactly the kind of thing that Putin is, is picking up on. But the reality is, and I think William already alluded to this, that in the most recent election in Ukraine, uh, the party that um, passes most closely for a far-right party in uh, Ukraine, uh, Svoboda, uh, received 2% of the vote. There, there is there are neo-Nazis in Ukraine, just as there are everywhere in Europe. Uh, there are more neo-Nazis in most of Europe than there are in Ukraine today. Uh, so I think the, um, it's, it's very tempting, as particularly for Holocaust historians, to, uh, to pick up on uh, these, uh, these references to Bandera, 
uh, or to the OUN in Ukrainian culture to say, oh yes, Ukraine has a problem uh, with celebrating its, its fascist past. In fact, uh, I think the reality is, uh, is quite the opposite. And the, the threat of fascism uh, now uh, is coming quite clearly not from Ukraine, uh, but from Russia. And I think with that, I'll, I'll stop and hand over. Okay, Dan, thank you very much. Um, so I, I, will, I will also just um, say a few uh, brief words about, um, about, about the sort of historical narratives that the Kremlin um, has been, uh, been using um, to, to justify uh, the invasion. And um, they, I think, undercut what has become quite a familiar narrative uh, to us, which is that Russia is motivated primarily by sort of geopolitical concerns. So, I mean, th those I think are twofold. One is military, the, ex the eastward expansion of uh, NATO, uh, and the other is political. So the fear of um, colored revolutions um, in states on Russia's borders, of course, you know, Ukraine um, in, that, in that regard is a, is a, is a you know, particularly sensitive case um, for uh, the Kremlin, because, you know, if there is a successful um, democratic liberal state constructed in Ukraine, then of course it would beg the question: Well, why not um, in Russia uh, itself? But I think that if we if we look carefully at statements that um, Putin has been making um, over the last few years, um, and indeed you know over the last decade uh, or more, it's very clear that he's thinking not just geopolitically but also uh, historically. And I'll just zoom in on, on one, one publication um, which has been discussed, um, but of which you may not be aware, which was a 5,000 word uh, article. So by the time you translate it into Russian and um, put in uh, definite and indefinite articles, it, it sort of comes in at nearly 7,000 words. Um, and it was entitled on the historical unity of uh, Ukrainians uh, and, and Russians. And um, the article was sort of a warped, uh, a warped account of, um, his, the, of, of, the, of the history of, uh, particularly of Ukraine, um, and it amounted to a series of propositions that, um, that Ukraine lacks any distinctive identity, that what passes for a state, as far as Putin is concerned, actually has no real basis in historical fact. It's cobbled together from territories um, that belonged uh, to the Tsarist Empire uh, or to the to the Soviet uh, Union, and so it sort of amounted to a denial of uh, Ukrainian uh, statehood. Um, and I, th I think, I mean, I, I, I might be I'm happy to be corrected by other members of the panel. I mean, my sense is that when this essay was published last summer, um, most people did not take it to be a kind of political manifesto. I mean, they saw it as, you know, in the yet another publication, this kind of, in, 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 a, in, a, in, a, in a sort of series of, you know, statements and, 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 and um, outputs that were um, part of a sort of nationalistic sort of cultural war that's being waged um, by, by the Kremlin, um, and it's designed to kind of rally, rally followers to, to Kremlin policies. But I don't think many people saw this um, as as um, uh, one uh, one commentator and as Aslam did as a, as as setting the stage for war, um, what Putin essentially argued, um, or what what the, what the essay essentially said, was that Ukraine is Russia's historical patrimony, that it doesn't it doesn't have the right to um, to independent uh, statehood. And this, this claim has been supported um, by um, something that, that Natalia Mosenko was talking about, which is this idea of the Russian world or Ruski Mir. And then, I mean, the term has been sort of floating around in, in sort of among, among Russian nationalist uh, historians and, uh, and, and, and um, sort of intellectuals. You know, for for for, for at least um, 20, probably 30 now uh, years. <laughs> But it really, in the wake of the of of the Maidan um, in in Ukraine, it really moved centre stage, and sort of um, arguments that were you know being made on Facebook posts that would you know garner a few a few dozen likes 
were suddenly being um, put out from broadcast studios uh, in, in Moscow and were being um, uh, fed out onto the internet through um, the Kremlin's uh, online um, uh, uh, sort of social media uh, operation. So it's really kind of moved, moved um, center stage. And the idea behind this is that um, Russians are a people who are, as a result of the collapse of the Soviet Union, have found themselves tragically separated by borders. But they are now a dispersed people. So the, the what I mean, the closest thing to a sort of um, an ideologue in the Kremlin, Vladislav uh, Surkov, uh, said that you know the Russian world is wherever there are people who speak Russian and think like Russians. Um, and, and what sort of was 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 presented here was that Putin's historical mission was effectively to reunite these these people, you know, to look past existing borders um, and and to reassemble um, a, a a state which included and, and you know protected uh, all all Russians. Um, and interestingly, the, 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 I mean, the game was sort of given away a bit in an article that appeared in the in the uh, official state uh, media uh, channel uh, Ria Novosti on the 24th of February. So it was published on the day of the invasion, but it was time stamped for two days later. So this was clearly an article that had been written in advance of a sort of successful blitzkrieg attack on Ukraine that, of course, never materialized. Um, but the uh, the author, one Pyotr Akorpov, said quite openly in, in, in this article um, that um, Putin had taken on himself the historic responsibility of uh, resolving the Ukrainian question, as he put it, um, you know, there obviously very chilling echoes of that, of that phrase. Um, I mean, and he said that there were two principal motives for this. One, he said, was geopolitical. It was about ensuring that Ukraine did not become um, sort of an outpost of or a staging ground for kind of Western pressure on Moscow. But he was quite clear that the real reason was that Putin was um, had 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 um, uh, once and for all returned Ukraine to Russia and had reunited uh, the Russian people. So. I think the anticipation at the beginning of the of the invasion, which of course has now been exposed as a sort of grievous miscalculation, was that Russian forces would be welcomed by significant parts of the Ukrainian population, that the Ukrainian state would collapse, um, and that you know by now, you know, with lots of kind of muddying of the waters, you know, the Kremlin would be kind of able to make arguments about. Um, you know how this was a you know this was sort of an unpleasant business, but one that enjoyed you know sort of both a, a measure of popular support and um, historical uh, legitimacy. And I think that 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 in in a way this this historical dimension is quite um, you know I think has caused among you know many experts in the field um, a, a sort of reappraisal of what is driving uh, the Kremlin. So I think many commentators, and I absolutely include my, you know, I'm not, I'm not a commentator on contemporary Russia, but my impression was also that really all this stuff about kind of the Russian world and reuniting the Russian people was essentially sort of colorful packaging on a project that was basically sort of geopolitical in its orientation. You know, it was, this was about sort of defending what were perceived to be Russia's interests in the here and now. And you can make historical arguments because they, you know, they strengthened your, your, your case, they rallied the population, they sort of ennobled something that was otherwise quite a kind of sordid business of just sort of deploying um, geopolitical power in a, in a contest with the West. But I think that what, what, what in the context of these historical statements, um, you know, I think we have to allow a bit more now for the possibility that, you know, Putin really is a sort of true believer or that there are, you know, there are, there, there are, there are significant um, figures within the Kremlin who believe in this historical mandate to reunite, you know, Russians across across the borders of, 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 of the states that emerged from the collapse of the uh, Soviet Union. And, you know, if Putin is a true believer, um, then, you know, Russian history, um, you know, is, is, is full of examples of, of, of why we should be, you know, deep, deeply fearful of uh, true believers. So that's not a very, um, you know, very optimistic um, outlook. 
But I will hand over now um, to uh, Professor Sam Green, uh, who's going to talk to us um, about um, the Russian sort of contemporary Russian situation, what the implications of the invasion are for for Russia and its relations with the wider uh, region. So, um, Professor Green, over to you. Okay. So, sorry. First of all, thank you very much, Daniel, for for the invitation to to to, to join this this panel today and for bringing this this panel together um, to Volodya and, and, and Natalia in particular. Volodya, it's very good to see you again. And Natalia, it's very good to meet you, although I would rather meet you and see you in very different circumstances and and face to face in Kiev or Odessa. Um, I'm an outlier doubly um, uh, on this panel as well, because I'm, I'm not an historian. I'm a political sociologist and, and, and I'm not a Ukrainianist, um, so I'm not going to attempt to say anything about um, about Ukraine. Um, I do, though, want to think a little bit um, about um, how the history of this is going to get written um, uh, sometime uh, from now when we have the advantage of, of the opportunity to, to look back on it. Um, and, um, and I want to you know, point out that, that most of us who are in the business of, of, sort of predicting history right before it happens, um, you know, uh, we're divided about whether this war was going to happen, right? Uh, certainly in the way that, that it did happen. I, you know, the first to admit that I got it wrong. Um, I thought this war was not likely to happen. I thought obviously it could happen. There were 150 to 200,000 troops parked on the border, right? Which meant that war was, you know, a, a very real possibility and one that certainly policymakers had to take seriously. But I looked at the costs and benefits involved in uh, undertaking that war, both for Putin as a politician and for Russia as a country, and it just didn't compute uh, for me, right? So clearly I got something and a lot of my colleagues got something wrong. There were uh, two groups of people who didn't make that mistake, right? Uh, or who didn't get that wrong. One group of people was the military analysts who were looking at the configuration of troops along the border and saying, it doesn't matter whether it makes sense, right? That this looks very much like preparations for uh, uh, for an operation. Right? You can take that seriously, but it it it, it um, certainly seems to have been more right than mine. And there were another group of people who I sometimes flippantly refer to as mind readers, right? Um, who were absolutely sure that they knew what Putin was thinking and when he was thinking it. Uh, and I don't have you know the luxury of access to to to, to you know to Putin's brain. Um, so I had difficulty with that, but I do think that we have to, as Daniel was just suggesting, take seriously, certainly my colleagues in, 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 in political science have to take seriously the, uh, uh, the roles of, of ideas and ideologies and identities um, in creating political outcomes in ways that do not usually sit well with our um, you know, theories of rational actors. It's not to say that we need to be thinking about Putin as an irrational actor. That's a conversation again that you know he can have with his psychotherapist. But um, it is, um, uh, it, it, we at least have. I, I think I'm, I'm increasingly uncomfortable, right, with the ways in which we have discounted some of those, and I myself have discounted some of those explanations when it comes to the actions of people in positions like Putin. That said, I think we also have to be equally careful about taking things that make sense to us now and re-imputing them as explanations of the past. I think that there's a very real danger that because we see Putin speaking and acting in ways that uh, make sense from uh, an ideological perspective or, or from a perspective that takes ideology and identity uh, and, and uh, historical narratives seriously, um, that that necessarily means that that was the reason that this is happening, right? Or, or that it, that it, it you know, even worse than that explains sort of the entire trajectory of Russian um, uh, state building since the end of of the Soviet Union. I think also there's a tendency at moments like these, um, uh, and and we have had a lot of moments like these, right? Uh, whether it's um, a war that shocks us or a referendum that shocks us or an election that shocks us or the end of the Soviet Union, these big complex phenomena right, that, that emerge out of lots of things going on, we tend to look for uh, an encompassing explanation and a single explanation that, that covers the, the waterfront. And I think often that can tend to be um, uh, a mistake and can then lead to, to bad decisions as we try to figure out what, what happens next. Um, so that's um, uh, sort of 
where I am personally as as an, as an analyst um, at the moment. Now, to the to the questions that that, that Daniel put in front of me, the, the impact of this. You know, I said that that I and, and some of my colleagues got the, the cost benefit analysis wrong, right, in terms of thinking about whether or not Russia um, was going to undertake this war. Um, that's only partly true. Um, we certainly didn't understand um, how the benefits uh, in, in this situation could possibly outweigh the costs from Putin's perspective. But we weren't wrong in in um, uh, in in the expectations of the costs right, on, on that side of the ledger. Right. And those costs are essentially three, and 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 they're all coming to to bear. One, which which Volodymyr described very well at the outset, obviously, is the is the military cost. Uh, wars are are unpredictable. Even when you think you're going to win them off, and you don't, or you win them at greater cost uh, than you uh, expected to. Right. Um, and that is certainly coming coming true. Um, the the second is the uh, the economic impact. Right. Uh, and, the, and, the, and the sanctions impact. Uh, Putin, as we've heard the Russian government say, believes that Russia would be um, uh, not sanctions proof, but at least able to withstand them. Um, that turned out to be a miscalculation. Right? So the impact on the Russian economy is, is already quite significant. The uh, ruble has lost something between 30 to, to 40 percent of the of its value, sort of depending on on the hour, this has caused runs on banks, this has caused runs on, on product markets, and is causing quite uh, a, a, a degree of, of, of public panic as well as panic among um, investors. And, um, and both the Russian and the international business community, in fact, the impact of the sanctions on the Russian economy and, and Russian economic behavior at the moment looks to even be somewhat bigger right, than uh, maybe even the people who designed these sanctions thought they were going to be. Right. There's nothing in the sanctions that forces IKEA to stop selling furniture in Russia, or that forces Visa and Mastercard to stop transactions um, on uh, on Russian cards. Right, but the the reputational risks um, and uh, and the sort of the forward compliance risks that many companies feel that they have, right, are such that uh, companies are getting out uh, ahead of these sanctions, as again are are Russian um, uh, consumers and, and and Russian citizens themselves. Um, in um, in ways that are causing very real problems for for economic decision makers. Again, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but we can we can talk about that if if we want. Um, the uh, third area of risk is is the Russian public. Right? If we think about um, what happened in 2014, right, um, the um, uh, annexation of Crimea uh, and the initial invasion of eastern Ukraine, right. Um, in terms of Crimea, this was a war that, from the Russian perspective, was almost entirely bloodless. In fact, it was a war that didn't involve fighting. Right? It was a war that didn't involve an invasion so much as simply opening the gates um, and and taking control of of a territory and of a uh, and of a political process within um, uh, within that territory. It was over before most Russian citizens knew that it was happening. The war in um, in eastern Ukraine was begun and fought. Um, in ways that, again, were not transparent to Russian citizens, right, by and large, um, and that involved relatively small numbers of, uh, of, of regular military, larger numbers, obviously, of, of mercenaries and, 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 and contract military organizations, um, and was fought in, in, in large measure through, through proxies. Right? Um, this was inevitably going to be very different, and it is already very different. Right? Um, as a result, we see a Russian public that, despite eight years of consistent propaganda, um, again, in a lot of the ideological terms that, that my colleagues on the panel have already described, right? Um, and despite eight, eight years of, of conflict and confrontation um, with Ukraine and, and, and with the US and with Europe, we saw a Russian public that was not prepared for this war, that Barley didn't think this war was going to happen, and Barley didn't think that this war should happen. And we can talk about the polls we've seen since the war. I think they're very difficult to interpret and very difficult to take seriously. Um, um, but um, uh, the Kremlin is uh, worried um, about uh, about Russian public opinion, and we see that both in the number of arrests that we've seen uh, and the ferocity with which those arrests have been carried out. We see that at the door knocks that are going from house to house for people who have signed um, letters uh, and petitions against the war. Uh, we see that from the number of my friends and colleagues um, who are now um, in Istanbul and Bishkek and Yerevan and in, in, in Tbilisi and in, in increasingly 
um, in, uh, in, in other places. Um, and we see that from the way that the Russian political and informational space where it has, um, has transformed um, just in the last seven days. We have never seen this scale of informational control and, uh, and censorship. And frankly, um, this is only the beginning. Right? Um, so in terms of how this is going to impact Russia going forward, I think we are looking um, at a, a very real and a very permanent break. Um, or permanent is the wrong word, long-term break right, um, between Russia and uh, any kind of integrationist uh, project. We're talking about autarky, not simply in an economic sense, but much more in, uh, uh, in a social sense. Um, that's going to impose very real costs on Russian citizens, and we're going to have to decide whether they are happy with that. Obviously, it will impose costs on Russian elites, who Putin is more concerned about than citizens at the moment, right? um, and who will also have to decide whether they're happy about that. Uh, I'll close with one thing. It's also going to impose um, some interesting costs on the rest of the region. Right? Um, so because of the way that the Eurasian Economic Union is structured as a customs union, it's going to be very difficult for Russia to be cut off right, without imposing that, that, that autarky on Belarus, Kazakhstan, Armenia, Kyrgyzstan, and, uh, and, and, and the rest of the, well, that's the core of the bloc. Right? Um, for the moment, obviously, um, uh, Moscow has tremendous leverage over Lukashenko and Takayev and and, 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 and Pashinyan, right? Um, uh, we can again talk about how that works. Uh, they, they don't have the opportunity to project to this. But Kazakh, um, are the population of all the buck against it, um, that their government may have the right to control. Stop there. Uh, thank you very much, um, Professor Green. Um, so perhaps take some questions from 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 the room to begin with. We have some in the chat. Are there any? Uh, okay, I think probably these. If you, I, I will I will repeat your question for the benefit of the panelists online. Sure. Um, so as we've seen in the last few weeks, NATO has seen great parallels as a Russian proxy for the United States in the Eastern Balkans. Is there any sense of that in Ukraine? So my question is, looking from sort of historical this course, like Britain originally signed up to the same Malaz Accords in 1998, which was the EU common security defence uh, policy. So would you say that there's a possibility since Brexit and Britain's um, going down their own path with like their own military integrated reviews in like 2000 uh, this year, um, do you think there will be more alignment between Britain and the CSDP in trying to uh, reinvigorate defence policy in trying to tackle this situation because NATO seems to not want to obviously not get involved in the current situation. Um, okay, so I think it's, uh, well, it's a question for anyone really. I guess um, so. The um, the question is, do, do we do we see do we see the the conflict as um, if I if I sort of read it in slightly broader terms, do we see do we see the conflict uh, strengthening an independent European uh, defence capability um, or do we see it strengthening uh, NATO? So is this is the conflict in Ukraine likely to um, strengthen cooperation and 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 sort of military muscle within the European Union uh, or is or is this still going to be a case of European states looking to NATO for for um, leadership and defence. Can I? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Right. A great question, actually. It might kind of work both ways. First of all, of course, we have seen American leadership in play. Uh, without American coordination and, and prodding and uh, putting everyone together there would be no anti-Putin coalition or anti-war coalition these days. And uh, that, that, that's just a fact. Uh, what amount of work that American diplomacy has done ever since the end of October, think about it, we're now sitting already, it's, it's March, uh, is tremendous. And they've been trying to explain what they're afraid of. They've been trying to share with their allies information about preparation for invasion. Then, then they actually started putting everyone together and they really performed as a leader of the NATO. And that wasn't easy, especially with the background of what happened with uh, Afghanistan's role, what happened with AUKUS and French submarines thing, 
uh, that wasn't easy because a lot of people in the Europe, uh, in NATO capitals were uh, really unhappy about what the Biden administration did then. But still, uh, they, they all kind of overcame this, people in Washington they overcame this and they put the coalition together. And it was amazing. And, if, and I, I, I think it's probably the best example of American leadership in European security ever since uh, uh, mid 1990s, since Dayton Accords, since the former Yugoslavia wars, when Americans actually had to lead uh, to, de do, to deal with those, those issues. But at the same time, at the same time, it's also a signal to Europeans that they should be serious about it. And if leader of the Social Democratic Party of Germany, now Chancellor Schulz, understands this now, that billions and billions should be put in defense, that 2% of GDP being spent on defense is probably not even enough, but, but at least 2% should be spent, then I think many other places in Europe they will understand that. And of course, uh, uh, so therefore, that's why I say, I think the sig what, what is happening is a two-pronged signal. One is Americans are the leaders. Uh, you need US involved in European security. And another, but another one that Europeans should actually stop being just, uh, uh, just uh, free riders and they need to contribute financially, militarily, and they should understand that this threat that Ukraine is facing right now is not a threat, it's a war. It's, it's re it might really go further beyond beyond. And if you think about the security proposals by Russians from December 17th, uh, they didn't just mention just Ukraine. They mentioned half of NATO. You know, they mentioned uh, everything uh, that happened since 1997. So I think everyone has woke up. I think uh, definitely everyone in Eastern Europe is really troubled now. But who knows? Does it end with Eastern Europe only? The the, the Russian revanchism and uh, uh, you know the revisionism rather. So I think uh, that the, the answer then is that uh, uh, it is both. American leadership is needed, but European component is extremely important as well. Um, so um, this is perhaps a question for um, uh, Natalia Moisienko uh, from the uh, from the uh, chat, um, uh, which is. Um, uh, you, so you identify the definition of Russian uh, peoplehood, I don't know who the U is, but the, the definition of peoplehood based on shared language and a way of thinking. Do Ukrainians uh, in their definition foreground their commitment to democracy, their constitution, or do they hold to an essentializing notion of Ukrainian peoplehood, such as the one recently invoked on Twitter by Yuval Harari. I mean, I'm afraid I don't know Yuval Harari's reference, um, but on what impact does the war have on that narrative? So if you could speak to that, thank you. This is, this is, a, this is to, to answer this question, it, took, uh, it will take some hours, of course, but I shall try to do it briefly. And uh, I would uh, just uh, uh, make a short, uh, very short historical, uh, historical excourse into the uh, history of the independent Ukraine from 91. So, and uh, several uh, uh, points, would like to make several points. We have uh, several Maidans uh, after uh, this, and all these Maidan were focused on the Ukraine democratic Ukraine democratic development, on this development of the European sentiment, on this development of the uh, free nation. Uh, and uh, the, I think uh, uh, that uh, this terrible war shows once again the unity of all Ukraine, of the Ukrainian people in this democratic notion of the nation, because the uh, na the nation of um, sorry, I'm very pathetic today. The nation of slaves cannot be so united and cannot go against uh, against uh, the enemy, as uh, Professor Dubovik already uh, explained uh, at the very beginning. Uh, don't I don't understand uh, what else could I add to show how uh, 
Ukrainian nation is uh, fighting for its independent uh, now. Uh, Every media of the world shows it. So what does it prove? The nation is united for the democratic values, you know, united, extremely united uh, around its uh, leaders, around its president. And uh, this is, uh, from my point of view, uh, this is... Uh, the unique example in the recent uh, world or European maybe history, such unity and uh, such battle for freedom. Was it uh, is, is okay? And uh, uh, sorry, just uh, one uh, small note, of course, being in arts, I would like, of course, once again to note that the free spirit of Ukrainian people is very artistic. And even now I'm sitting in Kiev and uh, <laughs> waiting for guests So uh, from Russia. And what I'm doing, I'm collecting incredible examples of the Ukrainian artistic uh, spirit. Uh, a lot of, a lot of, uh, well, I wrote a uh, book out of my town, of course, it will be encyclopedic now to write about all these uh, tragic events and how Ukrainian adopt them and how they laugh uh, on the Russians, uh, on these, uh, and on the uh, Russian soldiers, on the, on Putin, because they are, uh, they are because they are fighting for its country, for its motherland for the center of Europe, and because the heart of Europe is now in Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Natalia. I'll, I'll, take, um, I'll take one more question from the, the, the chat. Um, so Mike Lorne asks, um, given the supposed differences in cultural heritage in the west of Ukraine when compared to the eastern Ukraine, do you believe Moscow has a total occupation in mind uh, and Eastern annexation or merely regime change? Does anyone want to comment on what they think the Kremlin's sort of immediate um, military and political objectives are in, in Ukraine? Well, except to be me, I suppose, again, uh, well, I'll start at least, uh, let me. Uh, I, again, like Sam said, uh, we are not uh, mind readers, uh, clearly uh, not of that dark mind that uh, belongs to Vladimir Putin. It's even harder to see through it. But uh, I don't know what ideas he had before that. Uh, I don't know if he had any strategy. Uh, he has never been known for, for a good uh, um, uh, on strategy. He was normally a very good tactician. He would uh, do a little step and then he would reassess and regroup and see what reactions he gets. And then he would think about some few more steps forward. So I'm not sure he, he had a strategy, but right now he would have to reassess. Uh, he or some people around him, I don't know. There have been so many rumors about what's going on in Moscow now, where is Putin now. I'm not saying there is a coup in play, but uh, a lot of people are not happy about his decision. And, and, and very few people in Moscow, as we know now, for, for a fact, all right, uh, knew about what, what was going to happen and about this decision. You know, very, very few, very few. Definitely none of the Russian diplomats, for instance, like Lavrov and others, who were taking part in these negotiations for weeks and everything. And, and, and all of that was just a, just a waste of time. It's just small screen, small screen for preparation for invasion. So anyway, we don't know what they're planning, uh, but their plans will be unraveled and undermined by, by Ukrainians. You know, the total occupation out of question. Uh, they, would, they would need uh, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people. And uh, they actually lost a lot of this fifth column here in, in, in Ukraine because of what we already talked about, the death of Russian, of Russian world here. A lot of people are not happy about it at all. I mean, sitting in those uh, basements under the Russian bombs, even if you're sympathetic to, to, to Putin uh, for, for a number of years, kind of kind of have an impact, could have an impact on your thinking about what you what you so think about Putin and Russian occupation now. So they wouldn't have enough force for that. I mean, they're really bogged down right now on a few occasions. Of course, they can throw some more military there. It's a huge military. I mean, some people say it's over one military people, a few people actually in Russian military. So they've only used, what, 170,000, 180,000. But what, what they had on our borders, they've used already. So 
Uh, could they divide Ukraine? They, they, they could try. Could they try and go back to the new Russia, Novorossiya concept of taking away east and the south of Ukraine at some at some format, you know, as a as a semi-autonomous, non-recognized, or even part of Russia? They get they could try, uh, but I don't think they would succeed. And also in terms of regime change, clearly uh, a non-starter for Russia. You know what? What are you talking about? I mean, unless you have the power of this total occupation and total control of Ukrainian territory, which they don't, uh, I mean, what they can do? Uh, say they kill Zelensky or something, or they uh, Zelensky leaves Kiev and they take Kiev and they do a parade and they introduce a new government. And what happens to that government? No one listens to it. Once the Russians leave, and they have would have to leave at one point, uh, no one would recognize that government. They would leave for one day. I mean, so whatever plans they had, uh, they have to reassess now. Uh, and uh, Ukrainian Ukrainians are a major player now in deciding their fate and their future and their destiny. We are not anymore some kind of item which doesn't have a, a voice. We actually do have a decisive voice. And uh, everyone is really, you know, either perplexed like Putin and others in Russia about how Ukraine fought back or you know, mesmerized and enthusiastic uh, about how we did that. If you're in the West, if you're supporting Ukraine, no one expected us to do that well militarily and otherwise. So therefore, whatever plans they have on their cards, I mean, uh, let them think about those plans. But uh, they wouldn't, they wouldn't, they wouldn't be able to 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 implement uh, it, it, them their way. Thank you. Yeah, in the, in the middle. Yep. Yeah. Um, so, we, from a historical standpoint, we talked obviously a lot about the Second World War and the Second World War. Um, the first Russian state in history was obviously centered around Kiev, and that's a huge claim that Putin obviously puts forward that the original Russian people settled around Kiev. That's a story to be. What would the Ukrainian retort to that be? Uh, so I, I, perhaps this question for well, perhaps, perhaps Will, um, William. So the, the, the question is um, the um, you know, the Russians or the, I mean, the Kremlin um, situates its historical claims to Ukraine in in Kiev and Rus, um, and what what would be the the Ukrainian um, sort of response to that in terms of its own historical narrative. Uh, yeah, it's a good question. Um, uh, it's very interesting that uh, shortly after the annexation of Crimea, one of one of the first things that Putin did was plan to build a giant statue of uh, Volodymyr the Great in, in uh, the center of Moscow. Um, you know, so sort of symbolizing the, the the connection to uh, to Kiev and Rus, and also to the Christianization uh, as well uh, in 1988. Um, yeah, I mean. The, the, there's a lot of kind of reading history backwards in this, um, you know, the, the idea that, uh, and there's a lot of confusion, especially I think the way West, in the West we often understand this, was between Rus and Russia. People think, well, you know, Rus is, it's often, you know, you might see it referred to as Kiev and Russia. But of course, um, you know, the Russia as, as the state that we know it now comes along many, many centuries after um, after Rus and sort of names itself in order to kind of it's almost a kind of memory gesture of memory politics almost to kind of tap into that uh, Christian heritage um, you know but there's, there's absolutely no more reason to consider Kievan Rus like you know the first Russian state than there is to, to call it the first Ukrainian state or even the Belarusian state you know that these, the, the histories are, are, are kind of uh, uh, entangled you know I, I think what I think in Ukraine, people have really no doubt that this is their heritage. It's not really a question. Um, they um, they don't have any sort of problems or complexes about that. Um, the uh, I guess they just um, they just kind of wish that uh, that Russia would, <laughs> would kind of leave them alone uh, and and uh, to, to you know create their own historical narrative uh, and stop kind of. Uh, reading history backwards in that way to, to kind of in, in, impose itself on them in all kinds of ways. You know, it's just another one of these uh, these kind of excuses uh, for the uh, for the aggression. Can I? Of course, yes. 
uh, it's a wide media campaign already just started to, in Ukraine uh, with name stolen. It means uh, that the uh, Russia, the name of the country, has been stolen from Ukraine. You just to explain key rules. So already translated in many languages. So if somebody wants to have a piece, I'll send you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, OK, so we've got uh, so turning to sort of contemporary politics. There have been a couple of uh, questions. I, I mean, perhaps, um, perhaps Sam, you could speak to this. So about um, whether there are any checks or balances on Putin's exercise of power um, in the in the Kremlin uh, at the moment um, and what the you know what your read is on the likelihood of 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 some kind of regime change in in Russia. Um, I mean, I think probably, I mean, perhaps I did, I'm, I'm sort of chipping in here. Um, I mean, I think a lot of people are, are, um, are probably wondering why there are not more Russians on the streets protesting. I mean, obviously there are some and they're extremely brave people, but, you know, in a country the size of Russia, we're talking about a very small percentage of the of the population um, so could you perhaps give a, a sense of, of, of what what your read is on sort of you know Russian public opinion and the possibility of of, of some sort of you know um, move against Putin perhaps from within his own circle that's surely for Sam sure thank you very much for um for the question. Uh, there's a couple of parts to the answer. One is that the process of getting rid of checks and balances, we want to use that term, right, uh, in, in Russian politics, right, is not a new process. It's a process that began, you know, when Putin took office in, in, in 2000, that began with the takeover of, of television, the consolidation of control over the political parties, consolidation of control over the federal system and governors over the judiciary. Um, and spread out into other sectors of the economy and civil society over time. Um, so that uh, it's been a long time since politics in Russia were, were, were competitive. Um, and the last elections in September 2021, the Duma elections, you know, were conducted in such a way that it was essentially impossible to contest them, to write about them, to monitor them, um, uh, in any way to influence them. Um, if you were not running your operations essentially through the presidential administration. So um, that is uh, that is not new. Uh, it's also not new that he's really worked hard to um, make it very difficult for um, the elite to mobilize against him right? uh, in a number of ways, both by cementing his control over the street, right? um, but also by um, really taking advantage, in fact, of the sanctions that have been been brought in since 2014 to change the financial situation, particularly of the economic elite, right? So Russian corporations, Russian oligarchs, Russian regions, anybody who has their own sense of a power base has to run their financing operations essentially either through the finance ministry or through, or through the central bank because there's no other way for them to access the kind of capital that they need um, uh, for, uh, for money. He also runs a very tight security state. Even the heads of the security state, though, he keeps about 20 feet away from him right? every time he sits down to 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 meet them right um he um so when it comes to uh the possibility of of an elite led regime change or or a palace coup or whatever you want to call it um it is possible i think that despite all of the changes in the system you know uh that we've seen over the years particularly accelerating since, since 2012 um uh this is um a sea change Right. Um, this this situation for, for, you know, that, that we're seeing evolving has the potential to deprive the Russian elites, including the economic and the bureaucratic elite, of any kind of autonomy, uh, because it deprives them of any kind of access to resources that cannot be confiscated overnight by the by the Kremlin, essentially by cutting them off from um, uh, from the West. Not saying that that is likely to produce um, a, a coup, right, or, or some kind of an elite-led uh, change of power. But if there is any circumstance that is likely, it is this circumstance. Again, it's very different from saying I think it's going to happen. In terms of the public, um, you know, again, uh, we don't know how many people have been out on the streets. We do know that about thirteen and a half thousand people have been arrested in in, in a little bit more than a week. 
um, uh, you know, that the, the, this wave of protests has and the numbers of arrests have been larger than the protests that we saw in January and February 2021 around uh, the return and arrest of Alexei Navalny. Um, it represents a somewhat broader coalition, but for the moment, it, it, it does represent that coalition of people who, who have been protesting anyway. Right, have been protesting at least up until 2021 when protests in Russia really began to turn violent um, and be heavily repressed, uh, who were protesting uh, over politics, over human rights, over civil rights for for years. Um, you know, to, to, to it, in, in essence, the, the people who are currently standing in line trying to get money out of the bank or standing in line trying to get food on the shell off the shelves are not the people who are protesting. Right. Um, uh, the people um, who uh, are, uh, that's a much larger number of people, right? But the, it, what it comes down to, I think, is that the, the political divide in Russia really isn't between, you know, people who are happy and people who are unhappy, right? It's between people who think that um, a, a change of political leadership could, could make a difference and, and people who, who don't. So that's always been the challenge for the, for the, for the opposition, right, is to convince people that, that if you were to elect Navalny or, or whoever else, that uh, it might lead to, to more accountable government, it might lead to more prosperity and security for you and, um, and, uh, uh, and your family, right? So um, uh, there's, there's lots of reasons why, why people don't protest. One is one, uh, fear is one of them. Lack of information is one of them. Um, but lack of a sense of their own agency uh, is is also one of them. I would like to point out once again about Russian studies throughout the world, especially in the Western universities. Uh, in direct, direct or indirect ways, uh, they have been sponsored for a long time by Russia. In direct or indirect ways, they have become the tool of Russia, the tools of Russia. And in direct or indirect ways, they have become influencer, influencer in Russia, influencing the Russian uh, academia. And uh, this come all together. The Western universities took part in all these uh, <laughs> development uh, or cherishing and preserving of Russia propaganda, the Western universities must also take the responsibility. This is a fact. Thank you. Um, yeah, well, I, I think. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not sure I would agree with with all of that. I think that some. I mean, there are certainly some institutions that are now, you know, rather um, embarrassed by you know money that they have, you know, taken from various uh, Russian Russian sources. Um, but I, I don't. I wouldn't go as far as to say that they they have become sort of tools of 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 of, of the Kremlin. And I think there are still plenty of uh, critical voices um, within, you know, Russian Russian studies and, and experts on 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 Russia um, were, you know, working in Western universities. I and mean, then I sort of like to think of myself as one of them. Um, uh, could could we take I've got a, a, another perhaps another question in, in the in the room. Um, yes, yeah, so over there. Um, so thinking a bit about the discussion going on in Germany about increasing military spending and then also the increasing military spending in contrast to that, just global panic about the possibility of World War III. Um, how do you see um, nuclear disarmament happening or continuing or um, just going backwards? Um, what do you see in terms of the outcome of nuclear weapons? Okay, so both, so that so that that question actually chimes with a couple of questions in the chat, which are which are um, perhaps unsurprisingly about the nuclear. Threat or, or you know the consequences for nuclear armament or disarmament uh, in in Europe. So would anyone like to um, to speak about um, Putin's sort of muscle flexing, um, if I can put it that way, um, with with um, uh, Russia's nuclear arsenal and you know what the consequences might be for uh, Europe and and attitudes towards uh, nuclear nuclear weapons uh, on, on, on the rest of the European continent. 
Look, look, one thing I might say is that uh, I, I wouldn't be saying just ignore what he's saying about nuclear weapons. That would be wrong. But having said that, uh, most of his uh, statements recently about nuclear weapons uh, has been a signs of weakness on his part, that his plan is not working, that conventional weapons and his army in Ukraine is not working according to the plan. Even though there are some people who wonder if he really knows uh, the, the full picture of about what's going on in Ukraine with his with his military, but I guess he's guessing already. He is having even he's if he's only presented positive news from Ukraine, he is still probably wondering in his mind like what what's going on. Like it's been 12 days. They they told me they would do it like within two or three days or something. At least the key will be taken. So he is then, uh, you know, uh, saber rattling, obviously, and uh, the only, it's primarily a signal to the West, obviously, not to Ukraine. Uh, and that's how all of us here in Ukraine see it. Uh, we don't anticipate him using uh, tactical nuclear weapons against Ukraine, uh, but we see it as a scare, scaring the, 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 the West, stay out. And it's working, and it's working because, uh, you, you know, the no-fly zone uh, idea is not going anywhere because no one in the West, no one in NATO is, is willing to risk the direct confrontation with Russian military forces. Uh, because after all, it is a nuclear weapon, a nuclear superpower, and so on. So I think that primarily this is this is it uh, that he's uh, uh, ultimate resort uh, that he's using when he is unsure in himself and constant and when he's really say not, not seeing any other things in his instrumentarium. And we can use it. Uh, having said this, uh, you know, well, yeah, let's uh, think about deterrence and containment. Let's think about the Cold War. I think uh, it's a major wake up signal for the West that uh, the Russia was preparing for the new Cold War. Russia is kind of feeling nicely and comfortable this new Cold War uh, atmosphere and situation. Uh, they would probably be okay with this whole besiege fortress Russia idea and everyone is against us and the West, which wants to destroy Russia. Uh, the West is not. The West, of course, is, as Putin is and laid back and enjoying the peace dividend for 30 years of the end of, uh, after the end of uh, Cold War. So, but uh, there is a need to wake up. I mean, with, with Russia, like you're seeing today, uh, you need to do more thinking on nuclear issues as well, and turns and containment. And there needs to be a, a common strategy, not just by Americans, obviously, but uh, everyone who is in Europe. It's gonna be, again, not just uh, 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 some projects run from Washington, but it's got, have, has to be a common strategy, common position. We would materialize, would actually be created. I don't know. It might just not happen. But uh, there is a need to do that to confront Russia better, because uh, we passed through this. Uh, you know, we are seeing here in this in Ukraine. But everyone in the West should see Russia for what it is. It's a major threat to the international security, be it Central Eastern Europe, Europe, Eurasia, what have you. I've seen recently the sociological poll by El País, a major newspaper in Spain. The Spaniards agree there that Russia is a major threat. 48% of those who were polled in that poll said that they wouldn't mind sending troops to help defend Ukraine if needed. And that is Spain we're talking about. That is one of the least hawkish nations in Europe. So I think Europeans are waking up. And uh, the preparation for dealing with Russia better as a nuclear power, as someone who is actually uh, chair, I mean, who, who is head, the country which is headed by a madman with a nuclear stick, you know, that preparation for any eventuality there should be part of uh, any thinking in the coming years. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, so I think we've got uh, time for one one more question from the room. Um, yeah, if we take it over there. <clears throat> on this topic, so this is more towards um, the Asia Pacific now, because I think we see some parallels between Russia and China now, with China and Taiwan. Um, so I think it was very clearly demonstrated at the very start of the war that Putin managed to divide the West 
and it's only now that somehow they've managed to get everything together where they come up where they came up with some kind of um, united response. To what extent do you see that the West is still in a sense fractured? That you know everyone's still got their own vested interests in whether it be Russia, China, or their own country. So do you think, say, if um, Ukraine was part of NATO by some miracle, this is just very hypothetical, and it's linking back to Taiwan, that if that Russia attacked um, Ukraine as a part of NATO, would the West still be able to mobilize and defend their ally via Article 5, or would they still stay out of it because of vested interests? Okay, it's just a, so, um, there's a question about the, um, the, the endurance and the robustness of, um, of, you, of, of the sort of uh, unity that's been on display among, among European, um, European powers since uh, the invasion began. Um, you know, does the panel think that this is, this is something that will uh, stand up, or do they do they see it being sort of overcome by the kinds of fra fractures of sort of along lines of of, of self interest that you know we've seen we've seen a great deal in in European politics in the last you know the last couple of decades. Um, I don't know if anyone wants to speak to that. Well, I would hate to hijack the remaining minutes as well. But uh, yes, uh, we've seen uh, unprecedented unity of the West. Uh, nothing that we've expected, actually, frankly, including myself. I was expecting much more disunited response, and we've seen quite a united response, and that's unprecedented because the threat is unprecedented. Because what Putin is doing is also unique and unprecedented. Does it mean that the West will remain united in all uh, of these issues? Probably not. It could be fractured on this or that issue. Like today, for instance, the debate on the oil embargo, uh, uh, not by buying oil from Russia, uh, already seeing some fractures. Apparently, Washington tried to push through this idea of oil embargo, and they talked to Paris and Berlin and London, and there were disagreements. And Schultz is now sp speaking uh, uh, openly that, no, we're going to buy the oil and gas from, from Russia because we need it, and we are against the oil embargo. So on, on, on different issues here, you would have some disagreements. Uh, it's still not the level of consolidation and coherence like you had in the Cold War times. But even in the Cold War times, there were some disagreements. Right now, it's not a Cold War times, uh, obviously. Uh, and everyone in the West is trying to do their best to avoid the new Cold War. That's how it's different from what Moscow is doing. Moscow is comfortable, as I said, with the new Cold War. It's probably even beneficial to them in terms of a, a regime a consolidation and you know and so on. Uh, and, but uh, for the West, it's still the priority, the imperative is to avoid a new systemic Cold War with Russia, especially for Americans who are seeing China as a, as a major enemy, as enemy number, number one. So there'll be fractures for sure. But for now, we're also seeing absolutely uh, improbable, even like several months ago, unity of the West. Uh, Putin would do his best and would he try to do what he can to disunite the West even further. Uh, with all sorts of provocations here and there. But for now, we are seeing the common front, quotation marks, and that's really inspiring. Can I come in on that? Sure, yes, please do. Um, so I would agree with everything that, that, that Volodymyr said. I think um, to, to add to it, I mean, um, one thing to remember here, right, is that um, as much as we talk about NATO in this context and in, in, in the, in the run-up to this, right, the, the war in Ukraine did not begin in 2022. As we know, it began in 2014, and it began in 2014 in response to Ukraine's signature of a deep and comprehensive free trade agreement with the European Union. Um, Moscow sees the EU and its, its economic project as... <laughs> Um, as, as geopolitical and as a threat uh, in a way that the European Union um, does not. The EU began to recognize the geopolitical self in 2014 and then I think lost sight of that until now. Um, and it's, I mean, as, as Volodymyr mentioned, the, the, the sea change in, in Berlin in particular is, is striking. Um, it's potentially, um, uh, you know, very, very decisive for what Europe's future will look like and what the future security architecture will look like. Um, but I think it's also possible to read too much into it. We don't know whether it will last. 
Um, so there are, um, uh, again, there, there are reasons to think that, that things will hang together in, in, in a very different way and in a much more Eurocentric way. Um, and there are reasons to think that, that it might not. I think we also have to, to, to realize is that the, the, the question, you know, talked about sort of self-interest, you know, we as publics elect and unelect our leaders to be self-interested, to be interested in, in our welfare and, and security, not to be, broadly speaking, not to be liberal internationalists. Um, so if, if we do want them to behave like liberal internationalists, then we need to, to as, as citizens and, and, and voters, conduct our campaigns uh, on that basis rather than um, uh, you know, always coming down to pocketbook voting issues. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so on on that um, uh, sort of ra rallying um, ra rallying call, if I can put it that way, um, we'll, we'll we'll bring the um, bring the discussion uh, to a close. Um, so I'd like to thank all of the all the panelists for taking part, um, and especially to thank uh, Natalia and Volodymyr, um, who are doing so uh, as you I hope will all appreciate from extremely difficult uh, circumstances um, in Ukraine itself. Um, we, we wish you uh, both um, strength and uh, resilience and courage um, in, the, in the days and weeks uh, ahead um, and hope that you will um, indeed be able to join us again um, for, a, for a, you know, another discussion like this um, before uh, too long. So, um, thank you all very much for taking part. Um, I hope I, everyone will join me in giving um, our panelists a round of applause. I hope you can hear it. Okay, so thank you all very much um, and uh, good night. Thank you.